Hello and welcome to another edition of Washington Talks. I'm your host, Ron King, and we are privileged to have as our guest in the studio today the Executive Director of the Washington County, Pennsylvania Historical Society, Clay Kilgore. Clay, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Clay, as executive director of the Historical Society, I'm sure you needed some particular education to get into that line of work. It wasn't just a high school and down to the Historical Society, <laughs> was it? Where did you go to college and what was your major? I went to Penn State Barron, which is the campus up in Erie, and uh, my degree was just in history. Uh, that was my main focus. I had other you know, minors and another couple majors that didn't really mean anything in the end, but uh, mm -hmm. main focus was history. And then I started a master's uh, degree that would be more towards museum sciences and actually never finished it. Uh, never, uh, the job came at the Historical Society as curator and I ended up leaving to, to take it. So. Museum sciences, is that a thing? It actually is a thing, yeah. A lot of time they call it public history today, uh -huh. uh, but it's basically just anything you need to know to work at a museum. Okay, that's very good. Uh, uh, after you graduated from college, uh, you had a couple of other jobs, I understand, before you uh, took on uh, your present position. Well, I, yeah, I took over at the Historical Society as the curator. So my job was basically to take care of all the objects, the, the collections there. There's a large collection. They've got about 75,000 documents, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere around ten to 15,000 objects. And so my job was to care for all those. But then I was also working at Metacroft Museum, so I was a blacksmith and a tour guide and helped with uh, some of their programming. Uh, and then eventually I was working at the Bradford House, the David Bradford House right in Washington, uh -huh. and I was the uh, director there. So I was taking care of everything and then we uh, kind of split it up to where I was only doing the history side of it, which I enjoyed a lot more. So. Well, you know, blacksmith, I mean, I like the hairstyle for historical society, <laughs> blacksmith, uh, museum studies. Uh, yeah. You have the look. I, I just wonder if that's why they hired you, because you looked the part. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, they probably just wanted a taller guy that could lift and carry things. <laughs> they, some of those objects are big, so... <laughs> Clay, could you tell us a bit about John Julius Lemoyne, the gentleman who built the Lemoyne House? Yeah, so the Lemoyne House, it's named after John Julius. Uh, John was originally from France, actually. Uh, during the French Revolution, he was a loyalist. And so uh, as the revolution started to spread, you know, being a loyalist supporter of the king wasn't a good thing. And so he originally moved to the countryside in France, but as the rebellion, uh, the revolution continued the spread, he left, and he came across the ocean. He bought some land uh, through a land agent in Gallipoli, Ohio, which was a French settlement. Uh -huh. He got there, and uh, things went well for him at first. He was married. He had a, had a daughter. Uh, but then things kind of turned, and so he decided to leave. And uh, he actually, his wife didn't want to come with him. So mm -hmm. uh, he left his wife and his daughter behind in Gallipoli, continued to support them, but then came here to Washington, which he had traveled through. There was a larger French population here, and so he came to Washington and settled down. When did he build the, the, the house that presently stands? Well, he had a couple homes before that. Uh, so he would have gotten here around 1796. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a home up on North Main Street, and that acted as his home, uh, his doctor's office, and an inn. Then he had a second place that was the same way. And then by 1810, he wanted to build a new home. And so he started in 1810 and completed it in 1812. And it was his home, it was his apothecary shop, his doctor's office, uh, and then also uh, he had people that would apprentice with him that would stay with so him. So he's building at the time of the 1812 war. Yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> it would have been finished in late December of 1812. Okay. Uh, Clay, we know that uh, John Julius uh, Lemoyne was a surgeon, and we know that the, he had a... Son, too, uh, he, he was also a, a surgeon. What was the son's name? The son was Francis Julius Lemoyne, named after his father. Oh, okay. And, uh, of course, they were, they were both doctors. Yeah, they were. So John was a surgeon and a physician and had his apothecary shop. Francis followed in his footsteps, uh, went to school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and became a doctor and a mm -hmm. surgeon, and then came back to Washington and practiced medicine with his father. Okay, uh... Clay, history suggests that the son, Francis, uh, seemed to have uh, uh, an interest in 
abolition, uh, letting letting the slaves go at a very very young age. Is that correct? It actually is. Uh, we have a paper at the historical society that Francis wrote uh, around 1810. He would have been around 12 years old. Mm -hmm. He was at Washington Academy, which is the forerunner of Washington College right. and Jeff uh -huh. Washington Jefferson. So. He wrote this paper, and it was on the evils of slavery. And How do you think that, as you know, eight, nine, ten years old, he is uh, interested in something, you know, so, a subject so serious? How, how does that happen? I would guess that the French Revolution and his father being part of it, even though his father was a loyalist, I would guess that had some sort of influence on him. But uh -huh. it's really hard to say exactly where he developed these ideas, especially at such a young age. Yeah, I guess the... The old man, being a loyalist, he figured that uh, for health reasons, <laughs> it was time to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> With the French Revolution and all. Yeah, that's one of the reasons he did get out of there. Okay. Clay, most local folks know that the Lemoyne House was one of the stops on the Underground Railroad, which, of course, was an effort to help get uh, fleeing slaves uh, safely to the north. Mm -hmm. When did the Underground Railroad have its origins? It's hard to trace it exactly. Uh, what we look at is its origins in Washington County or southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. And you can start seeing it in the early 19th century. So the 18 teens, you're going to start seeing what we would consider an organized underground railroad. Because it would have been, you would have had slaves escaping before that. Uh -huh. But there was no real uh, organized effort to help them escape. Okay, prior so to no particular person or organization or a group was actually uh, heading up or sponsoring the whole thing? Not really. It was just anybody that was sympathetic. Uh, and you may only know one or two other people that's helping, but there could be 30 in your region. So uh -huh. even in this area, not everybody knew who was helping with the with the fugitive slaves. Oh, I guess it wasn't something that they were buying time in the lo local newspaper about, were they? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Clay, when I attended Fifth Ward, which was just down the street uh, from the Lemoyne House, uh, a bunch of my fellow students and I, we had heard that there was an underground tunnel. I mean, it sounds good, the Underground Railroad, oh, yeah. that there was an underground uh, tunnel from the Lemoyne House down to the local railway station where the slaves could, you know, go underground and through there. Is that true? Was there, was there a tunnel there? You know, I'll say that the biggest, biggest myth of the Underground Railroad is a, that there was a tunnel and that there was a train. Uh -huh. I'll tell you a real quick story. We had a... a, a, a a lady come in with her son. He was very young, um, you know, probably no older than six. Mm -hmm. And they came in for a tour of the Lemoyne House, and I got through part of the tour, and I started talking about the Underground Railroad, and I said, and you know, there was no actual train. It was just, they used that as the term. And I remember him looking up at his mom and go, you mean I'm not going to see a train? And he just <laughs> put his head down, like grabbed her and put his head down and never said another word the rest of the tour. And um, I mean, I and, and it, I tell that because that myth is goes with the Lemoyne House, that mm -hmm. what you're talking about, the tunnel, it never existed. And right. yet I have people come in all the time saying, oh, I heard there was a tunnel that was between the two Lemoyne houses because there's one directly across the road or uh -huh. one that went to the railroad. And there wasn't. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there was no secret <laughs> tunnel. It'd be great if there was because then I could take people on tours of it. We'd be a lot oh, more popular. Know. You know, you could like hop on the local train and go down to New Martinsville and everybody buy ice cream. I yeah. mean, they're going to be a buck in there for the historic. Yeah, society, probably would be. So. <laughs> no tunnel, unfortunately, though. Clay, the Lemoyne uh, House uh, houses the uh, Washington County Historical Society, and of course, it's a museum, uh, mm -hmm. too. Uh, well, the Lemoynes used to live in that house, so when did the house uh, quit being a private residence and start being a museum? Well, that's one of the neat things about that home is that the Lemoynes moved in in 1812. Uh -huh. uh, it would have gone through three generations, so John Julius, then Francis, and then his youngest daughter, Madeline Lemoyne. Uh, she would have died in 1943. She was 100 years old when she passed away. Uh-huh. And she left the house to the historical society. So we moved in in May of 1944. And so any changes, anything that's ever happened to the home, it was all done by the Lemoyne. So it's kind of like a timeline of them living there, that 130 years that they were there. Okay, no sooner than uh, Madeline leaves 
this mortal coil. A couple of years later, uh, the place was uh, turned into a museum. Obviously, she had uh, donated the, yes. the, the house. Uh, yes. That couldn't have happened that quick. No. Clay, no, I know that you have a whole lot of uh, interesting items down at that house, and I know one of the most interesting items you have is a human shrunken head. Where did the human shrunken head come from? You know, when people come into the house, uh, you know, if we have people that toured it when they were younger, uh -huh. you know, back in the in the prior to the 80s if they had toured it they come in and they say well, where's the head i want to see the shrunken <laughs> head they always remember it yeah. and it was it's just a shrunken head that was donated to us uh the story is that it came out of south america okay uh, and that it was uh that was brought here by somebody that was traveling somebody from washington county that had right. traveled uh -huh. and they brought it back with them and donated it um, it's not in our collection anymore, though. Whoa! Yeah, I know. Come um, on, that was like the most famous <laughs> thing you had there. It really didn't fit with what our, our theme was. You no, know, underground as soon as you site. open the front door, <laughs> see this head on a pole? I mean, what a conversation starter. I Yeah, but, it, you know... I, Probably when you're talking about slavery and the underground railroad, having a shrunken head isn't the best you, thing. You do have a point. Yeah. yeah, besides the shrunken head, you do have a, a lot of historical artifacts. If someone were to visit, can you just touch on a, a couple of uh, things in the house that they might see? Besides all the, the Lemoyne collection, we have all their furniture, their documents. We have letter, a wonderful letter from John Brown written to Francis Lemoyne. We have... Uh, Chinese naval uniforms from a Washington County citizen, Philo McGiffin, probably have seen his monument up at the courthouse. Yes, uh -huh. We have his naval uniform and a Chinese uh, uh, battle flag. Items that belong to Ulysses S. Grant because he was a frequent visitor uh -huh. to Washington. So there's there's a lot there. It's amazing. You know, I, I would imagine the insurance for that Lemoyne house must go through the roof. Yeah, it's one of our bigger expenses. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, for those of you who have not been to the Lemoyne house in a while, or uh, ever for that matter, we recently shot a short video to give you an idea of what things look like inside. So could you roll that video now, please? I'm Clay Kilgore, I'm the director of the Washington County Historical Society, and right now we are standing in the apothecary shop of the Lemoyne house. So the gentleman that owned the house, Francis Lemoyne, he was a physician and a surgeon, and this was his shop where he mixed medicines and treated people for their uh, various illnesses. The instruments that are in the case behind me here actually belong to Frank Lemoyne. Frank Lemoyne was uh, the son of Francis and was a surgeon during the Civil War. And this was actually one of the kits that he carried uh, during his service uh, at, uh, in, the, in the war, and most likely was the kit he was carrying when he was at Gettysburg. We're standing in the dining room, and actually this room started out its life as the surgery. So Francis and his father, uh, John, would perform surgeries here. After they had both passed away, there was no reason to have it as a surgery, and it was eventually changed in the dining room. Uh, so this is what it would have been set up like when the last Lemoyne lived here, when Madeline Lemoyne, who passed away at the age of 100 in 1943, donated the house. This is how she had it set up. We're standing in the bedroom of Francis Lemoyne, and actually the bed here, was used uh, to hide slaves at one point. There was a group of slaves, that fugitive slaves that were coming through. Bounty hunters were chasing them and they needed a quick place to hide them. And I know it doesn't seem like a great place to hide them, but they were hid under the bed. Francis's wife jumped into the bed, acting like she was sick. And when the bounty hunters came to the door wanting to search this room, they didn't come in because she was sick in the bed and you would not have entered a lady's bedroom if she was if her husband was not in town, especially if she was in bed. So they adhered to the morals and etiquette of the day and backed out of the room and the slaves were able to be snuck out and they made it safely north. We're standing in the uh, Washington County Military Heritage Museum, which is part of the Washington County Historical Society. And so the items in here range from everything from the French and Indian War up through Vietnam. And they are all things that were either carried by or brought home uh, by soldiers uh, that were from Washington County. Well, that concludes our brief tour of the Lemoyne House. I hope you enjoyed it, and back to the studio. Okay, we are back in the studio talking to Clay Kilgore, the Executive Director of the Washington County Historical Society. And now, Clay, the classic question. Does the Lemoyne House have any resident ghosts? It's, you know, that's another big question that we get. Uh, we have a lot of people that ask that, and I will say that 
there are people that believe there are ghosts there. I don't know what I fully believe, but there are things that have happened there. We've had employees that have worked there that have seen what we've kind of termed the lady in blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, a lady that walks around that they'll see sometimes in the home wearing this blue dress. And what was kind of neat about it was uh, one uh, day, one of the employees that had seen her before, I pulled out a book that had a photograph of all the dresses in our collection. And she pointed at one and said, that's the one that I see. Oh. And it was a dress that belonged to Madeline Lemoyne. Oh, man. wonder if Madeline was buried in that frock. <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be something? Uh, well, since we have it, no. But, <laughs> but it, it was one of the ones that she commonly wore, which I think is interesting. But, yeah, we've had people that, that say that there is people that will feel things that, that are maybe that are consider themselves sensitive. They'll feel well, certain you've things. You've like had the Paranormal Society in there, haven't you? We did. We had a, a local paranormal group, the Bassett Town Paranormal Society, uh, they've been in multiple times. And, uh -huh. and they find they, anything? They've done investigations. They found one thing that I thought was very interesting. I had no explanation for it. They were down in the basement, and uh, one of the guys, Mark, uh, Mark Hall, who was a member of the group, uh -huh. had said something. I, he had asked a simple question like, you know, is there anybody in here with us? Yes. And, of course, nobody heard anything, and they kept filming. But as they went back through and listened to the, the, the uh, audio recordings, uh -huh. uh, there was a voice right after he said that, that that comes in and says, you just walked right over me. Ooh. Um, so that kind of freaked us out. I don't like going in that room anymore. So <laughs> I was just going to ask you that. You know, you have to. Uh, I know they uh, don't staff the place with like a dozen employees, so you've got to spend a lot of time in there by yourself. Do you ever feel a little creepy sometimes if you hear if you hear the, the stairway creeping? Uh, uh, cr you know, do you, do you get a little uneasy? Honestly, I don't, except uh -huh. for that one room. <laughs> um, but most of the time, though, no. I mean, I've been there at midnight by myself and. Mm -hmm. You feel comfortable. It doesn't really bother you. But, I mean, there's definitely at times you feel like there's something there. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say there's a ghost walking around, but I feel like you can just sense, you know, if you think about it, I mean, people were, you know, babies were born there. People died there during surgery. Uh, you know, you had slaves that were hid there. So there's a lot of energy that's been left behind, and I just think that, that kind of remains in some, some ways. Interesting if you believe in ghosts. <laughs> uh, Clay, if anyone wants some more information about the Historical Society or the Lemoyne House, do you have a website they can uh, check out? Yeah, they can go to wchspa.org. So it's Washington County Historical Society, Pennsylvania.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has all the information about the Lemoyne House, the Lemoyne Crematory, Crematory, the Frontier History Center, uh, and, and the Historical Society itself. So. Yeah, and you, those uh, places you just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Historical Society supervises all those too, don't they? Yes, they do. So yes. you, it's not just that you have the Lemoyne House. No, we have several sites. Listen, Clay, I see our time is just about up for this edition of Washington Talks. Thank you very much for coming out and being our uh, guest today. It was really fun. I, I'm glad that you came in. Well, I appreciate you asking me to be here. I enjoyed it. Okay. And so then, on behalf of Clay Kilgore, Executive Director of the Washington, Pennsylvania Historical Society, this is Ron King saying so long till we catch you next time on Washington Talks.